Welcome back to the Academy of Higher Learning. This is Introduction to Python tutorial number four. In this episode, I want to talk about two things, one being recursion and the other being user input. The definition of recursion is, I guess, it's the repeated application of a procedure. So, well, I guess the easiest way to show you would be with the problem. And the problem is right here. If you're given a number, any number, I want to, or I want the program to print every number from the given number to zero in a decreasing order. So for example, if you're given uh, 10, I want it to output 10, 9, 8, 7, so on, 3, 2, 1, 0. And that's what I'm aiming for. So let's write our function. Let's call it countdown function. With, and we're given the number. and the basis of recursion is on if statements. So what we're going to do is we're going to define our base case, which is where the program would end. So once it gets to zero, we want it to stop. So if num is zero, then this is what we have our final thing. So our final statement. Else, what we want to do is, now this is if num is not zero. So if it's 10 or 9 or 8 or 7. What we want to do in this case is we want to print the number. And in the previous video, I talked about the difference between the print and the return command. And you'll notice why return wouldn't be suitable. Because it, with return, what it would do is it would end the function right here. So we have print the number. And after that, we want to call the exact same function. But we want to call it with one lower. So now, when it calls the function the next time, it will be at 9 instead of 10. So now we have to fix this part up. So when it becomes zero, what do we want to do? Well, it's zero. So all we want to do is we want to print zero. Or I guess just write print zero. So let's try this out. Countdown. Go 10. And we have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You could also do it with, I guess, let's go countdown. See, the idea is it would always work. The only problem is that it would take more time to process higher numbers because it would obviously have to go through it each individual time. A simpler way to do this is with loops and for loops, which we'll talk about later. And it's actually, it's much more simpler because the, it is the idea of recursion except much more efficient. So that is one form of recursion. I guess another simpler or similar idea would be the factorial function. And the idea behind the factorial is given a number, let's again use num, I want to calculate the factorial of it. And if you're not familiar with factorial, the factorial of let's say 4 is equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Again, the factorial of let's say 10 is equal to 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you'll understand that it's essentially the number times every number lower than it until 1. Because we can't multiply by 0. You have to note that we do not want to multiply by 0. Otherwise, you'll get the answer of 0. So let's write the function. We'll call it factorial. Second, factorial underscore function. And we have our number. And what we want to do in this case is if the num is 0, then we want to return something. So I'll just comment this, and I'll write return something. You notice the reason it's slightly different than the print is because this is the final value. This function is only going to return one value, and it's not going to print more than one. So if num is 0, return something. Else, we want to return the current number, which is, let's say it's 10, times the function minus 1. And you'll notice that what this does is, let's say you're given 4. It'll take 4 times this function again. Oh, but it's not 0, so it'll go back here. 4 times 3 times something else. We'll go through this again. Oh, but it's not 0. It's 2 this time. So it'll multiply it by 2, by 1. And eventually it'll get to 0. And this is when we're supposed to do something. 
we're supposed to provide another number that would replace this and give you your total. So what you could do is you could return 1. So what this does is instead of multiplying it by 0, when it reaches 0, it'll multiply it by 1. And a written example, because these are obviously easier to understand, is what factorial 4 would do is it would do 4 times 3 times 2, right? Because, or actually I'll run you through it. That should be easier. So you give it 4. It'll take the 4. It'll say it's not 0. So let's do 4 times. Let's go to this function again, this time with 3. It's not 0. So it'll do 3 times. And I guess this is now in brackets. And it'll actually it'll compute this. So it will convert this into 12. Now you have 12 times what is, it, this would be 2 now, right? So we go factorial 2. It's still not 0, so it'll be 12 times 2 times. So this would now simplify to 24. And now this is 1, so it would provide 1 here. Oh, sorry, it would multiply it by 1, which you then, again, simplify to 24 times. And now it provides 1 here. So now we're multiplying it by factorial 0, which in this case would return 1. So your final answer would be 24. An easier way to do well, it's not easier, it's actually just slightly more efficient, would be to replace this with a 1. And the reason for that is because you'll notice that in the last one, what we did was we had 12 times 2, which equaled 24. And then what we did was we did 24 times 1. And then we had the case where num was 0, and we did 24 times 1 again. But this step is really unnecessary. So instead of checking for 0, we'll just end it at 1, and we'll do 24 times 1, which is 24. You could also just end it at 2, and just multiply it by 1. And the reason that would work, oh sorry, you could multiply it by 2. And the reason that would work is because if you multiply it by 2, there is really no reason to multiply a number by 1. So this would end at 12 times 2, and it would just return that, which again would return the exact same value. Okay, so that is factorials, and I guess recursion. We're done with that. The next thing I want to get into is user input. And the idea behind user input is when a program is running, let's say I want to enter a number or a string or a floating point number or some sort of variable, something that the program needs. And that is essentially what user input is. So let's make a variable. We'll call it variable word, just because I'm so creative. And that is equal to user, or sorry, raw underscore input. And this is the kind of string you would put that it would output here. It would ask you what you want. So let's say we have enter a word, right? And what this function would do when you run it is it would ask, you just to enter a word. And so I can enter the word, the word. And now the word is stored in variable word. And to prove that, I can just run this. So enter a word, the word, and it printed the word. Now you'll notice a little problem. It, well, the input for where I could enter was right next to the string. A simple way to avoid this is with slash n. And what that does is it essentially just forms a new line. Sorry, it's other slash, n. And so what that does is it forms a new line, and you'll notice that now it's on a new line. New line. Again, you could just go more than one new line. You'll notice that this always works. I could write new line, enter a word. New line, new line, new line, enter a word. And I could print. You know, I said I asked enter a word three times in a row with two new lines each. And the space that actually occurs here is because of the space right here. So this new line command, it doesn't require anything but slash n. So if we were to run this now, it would all be in line. Okay, so that is, I guess, the new line and the foundation of user input. So one big point with user input is it'll always store anything as a string. So this is a string. But let's say you wanted to enter a number. Right? 
if you wanted to enter a number. Now if we enter, in this case, we enter 5. It prints 5, but this is actually a string. So now if we were to try and do, uh, let's say, let's call this 5 plus, that's the name of the variable. 5 plus, oh my god, is equal to, or, oh, you can't start variables with numbers, key point. So let's call this plus 5 is equal to variable word, which is actually a number now, plus 5. And so we'll try and run this, and we'll enter the number 10. And it returns an error. And the reason is because this variable word is a string. Regardless of whatever you take of this, it will return it as a string. So what you would have to do is you would have to convert this to an integer using the integer command. And so now, oh, sorry, we have to print plus 5. And so now I'll we'll do 10, and we return 15. Alternatively, you could convert it to a float, but then this would have to be 5.0. And you enter 10, you get 15. And so I guess that's the end of this episode. If you guys have any questions regarding Python or, well, if you have a question regarding another language, I could try and help you out with it, but I'm not sure how much I would be able to. But yeah, so take it easy.